Last time we covered the JFET, junction field effect transistor, and there's some other field effect transistors too. A very similar one is the metal semiconductor field effect transistor, the MESFET. Let me describe it and then compare it to the JFET. So the MESFET has a metal semiconductor junction as is, is described at the gate. So you have this uh, metallic pad and then a strongly doped N layer, always N in these applications, because uh, electrons have higher mobility. That helps us to use these uh, transistors at higher frequency. And it's on, on a uh, undoped uh, substrate. So typically gallium arsenide is used because you want the high mobility for, for high speed operation. Now let's consider the case where, okay, we'll put the source at our, our will be our reference voltage, so we'll just call it ground. And the drain is at some positive voltage, so it drives current through to the source. The gate is two possible states it could be normally off that is if the gate is negative then the reverse bias schottky junction here will have a very large depletion region if it's a uh, very negative it will be completely pinched off or there's normally on which is when the gate is we run up to a positive level giving a very small depletion layer so normally off is also the the normal operation let me review the schottky barrier dialed to you here. So if this is the gate and you have this metallic pad and then this type N semiconductor, the bands in the type N semiconductor will, will bend up as they approach the interface with the metallic. And if you put a negative voltage on the gate electrode, they'll bend up even more. Uh, there'll be a depletion region. They'll become depleted because you put a negative potential on this gate electrons are chased away from the uh, interface they they're sent deep into the semiconductor and so you have this carrier free zone and so the depletion width grows and grows as you raise this voltage we uh, we did work out ways to calculate it in chapter 4 so uh, i'll just give you this little expression here that that you can deduce from somewhere in chapter 4 look up in chapter 4 the expression for the depletion width you can uh, conclude this expression the thickness of that depletion layer is given by this but it's going to be position dependent because the voltage along the the channel has some position dependence because the drain is a different potential than the, the source so you, you have along here a different voltage and so that's reflected in this V channel of X term that I tossed in here. If you uh, make the gate negative, if you look at the expression, the depletion width gets thicker because you're going minus a negative, and so you're getting a thicker depletion region. It conceptually makes sense because if you put a negative potential on the gate, then the electrons in this area are scared away. They head out to other places. The electric potential here becomes very low with the negative voltage on the gate and so the, the bands bend up the potential energy becomes very high the depletion region grows with negative voltage so that's what you would call reverse biased putting that voltage negative so let's look across the the channel somewhere over here we have the source and somewhere over here we have the drain i just sort of drew it this way didn't draw the pads and if I look at the depletion region across the channel, as you go from the source to the drain, where the, and the drain is, is at a positive voltage, the depletion region is going to grow as you move towards the drain because the source is at the same potential as the gate, so you'll certainly have the smallest possible depletion region here. As you get closer to the drain, the potential inside the semiconductor is, is going up. And so electrons are being chased out of this area even more readily into the drain, which is positive. And so the depletion layer grows. If you were to make the gate voltage more negative relative to the source, then you, you can expect the depletion layer to be even larger because you've made the gate more negative. And so it's going to go down even more. And if you raise it in this illustration to minus one volt, the depletion region strikes the bottom of the doped semiconductor at the, the end of the, basically at the drain. And so you're in pinch off. If you were to raise the gate more, or if you were to raise the drain more, either one, the, the pinch off point would move into the gate. 
And so the the saturation voltage is always where the pinch off point is. So you always have a potential difference of zero to V sat from the source to wherever the pinch off point is. And then you have depletion from then on. But you have a potential difference also from the pinch off point to the drain. And so current still gets pushed through just fine. But you have the exact same potential drop, voltage drop across this region. And the resistance of this region doesn't change a whole lot. It changes a little bit. And so the current will change a little bit as you keep moving this pinch off point. And in principle, we take it to be kind of a constant current now once you get into pinch off, just like we talked about with the MOSFET. We modified the expression just slightly for the VD sat and, and W depletion, this e equation 416.5 from chapter 4. We uh, modified it slightly to uh, accommodate this situation where now we, you know, we, have a, we have a gate, that voltage that's at play and, and causing things to change. But the depletion width can be modeled going along here. A as you move from the source to the pinch off point, you can write the depletion width in terms of the channel potential at each given place up to the point where you reach VD sat and then beyond that the depletion width is simply the width of the semiconductor doped semiconductor which I'm calling A. Now let's compare MOSFET and JFET. First let's see what they have in common and then we'll see what's different. They both have ohmic contacts for source and drain pads. Okay, low hanging fruit there. Uh, they both operate with a negative gate voltage. They both use a type N channel because you really want the high mobility for high speed. And they both usually use gallium arsenide for that same reason, to get the high mobility so you can have high frequency operation. They're different in that the, the JFET was an actual PN junction. And that's what determined the depletion thickness, as opposed to the MESFET, where it's a Schottky barrier dial that determines the depletion thickness. In terms of manufacturability, MESFETs, the metal semiconductor FETs, are easier to fabricate. And the JFETs you know, have the uh, benefit of having a much higher barrier potential and hence less leakage current. So they're in the off state, they're not dissipating and then they also uh, do switch very very quickly so that's MESFETs let's look at a uh, another field effect transistor which is the mod FET uh, or the high electron mobility transistor modulation doping means uh, that you deliberately have regions with different levels of doping in the simplest case high doping and no doping and we'll look at that right now so you have a substrate of gallium arsenide Again, chosen to, as the working material because of the high mobility. But now we're going to make a heterostructure. And that's what's unique about hemp compared to MESFETs and, and, mod, and uh, MOSFETs. They're heterostructures, meaning you have actually different materials in, in contact with each other. So on top of the gallium arsenide, you grow aluminum gallium arsenide. And that aluminum gallium arsenide is doped, uh, and so it's N-doped. You notice you have N type all the way across from the source to the drain. Plus, so these are ohmic contacts uh, because you have the heavier doping in the semiconductor to metal, you, know, you have ohmic contact. But it's a lighter doping between the semiconductor and the gate, so it's a Schottky diode. Remember, ohmic versus Schottky is really a question of doping level, high doping, it's ohmic, in which case V equals IR through that, that uh, junction. And uh, if it's lower doping, it's a Schottky barrier and it has diode properties. We have aluminum gallium arsenide and we have end doping, but then a layer is placed beneath that. That's aluminum gallium arsenide, but it's undoped. So it's very pure, which gives it very high mobility. And then the gallium arsenide substrate is also undoped. So it's very pure. Aluminum gallium arsenide has a fairly high mobility. Here's some data I found in a paper for this, this particular alloy and uh, this particular not very high doping level. It's 2000, but it's still a lot less than pure gallium arsenide. So the mobility of the gallium arsenide is huge, 500 times higher than the aluminum gallium arsenide, but then doping. And so the principle of operation is that what you put a negative voltage on the gate the electrons then are chased out of this N-type semiconductor. Now it becomes rather deplete, highly depleted of electrons. Where do those electrons go? 
they go into the gallium arsenide. When they get into the gallium arsenide, they can move from the drain to the source with extremely high mobility. And that's the basic concept. Let's get a band diagram. First, there's a metal, which not too terribly interesting, but then the, the aluminum gallium arsenide has its conduction band edge and valence band edge. And the, this thin little layer here that of undoped aluminum gallium arsenide, I might uh, depict with bands that bend a little bit upward because of the it's not doped. Uh, the reason for having this undoped layer is to prevent the space charge that stays behind in the aluminum gallium arsenide from attracting the electrons back in. So the, the electrons get into the gallium arsenide and then they're far enough away that they're not columbically attracted back to all the positive charge that was left behind here. So the electrons go into the gallium arsenide and they're at the surface of the gallium arsenide, which is undoped. They accumulate there and their presence there, the mere presence of all those electrons that go in there, pulls the band of the gallium arsenide down. You know, normally, gallium arsenide is going to want to have his bands bent up, especially if you have a negative voltage on this gate over here. But it'll pull the bands down. And so now the electrons stay trapped at the surface. And what you have then at the surface is a sheet of electrons. And that sheet of electrons flows along the surface from the drain to the source with extremely high mobility. So they can go very fast, and that leads to a very high-speed circuit, a very high-speed device anyway. Now, that's called a two-dimensional electron gas, is the sheet of electrons. And it moves very, yeah, very, very quickly, very fast switching speed. Let's talk about that. So the highest frequency that you can use a device, 2 pi f highest, is the mutual transconductance divided by the total capacitance. This one over RC. The maximum frequency is 1 over RC. Uh, instead of R, we'll say use conductance upstairs. The mutual transconductance over the capacitance. Well, the total capacitance comes from a gate and parasitics. And that's kind of important. If you have a small gate capacitance, you can have a small total capacitance, which then gives you a larger operating frequency. And how do you get a small gate capacitance? Well, by making that gate as short as possible. So by reducing the gate length L, we reduce that, and we get a higher operating frequency. I mean, that's one way to go, but you can only do that so much. Gates are already really small, so another way is the high mobility. And so by having a high mobility in the channel, you have a higher conductance. When you have a higher conductance, you have a higher operating frequency. That's the real reason for having the high mobility transistors is to get a large mutual transconductance so that we can have a high operating frequency. These are some common devices now. First of all, there's the silicon MOSFET, NFET, that's N-type MOSFET, and that's its maximum operating frequency as a function of gate length. And notice that you know, as gate lengths get smaller, that capacitance shrinks and you can operate faster, yes. The HEMPs are are fastest. And that's aluminum indium arsenide, gallium indium arsenide hemp. If you can get the gate length down to 100 nanometers, you're able to have a transistor that works up to 650 gigahertz, which is screaming fast for a transistor. Back in the days when I did RF design, we used hemp you know, above a couple of gigahertz just because they they would work better, and you could get maximum gain out of out of them because you're getting into a frequency range where. MOSFETs can no longer deliver on the, on the gain. So there's these three different kinds of FETs we covered, the, the JFET, the MESFET, and the HEMP, just so you can see an alternative to the MOSFET. But integrated circuits are really all about MOSFETs. And so next time, we're going to go back to the MOSFET. <laughs>